Whether you keep them in your home or love to see them in theirs, these are the creatures that bring us all together. Reptiles. Reptiles. We're going to be delving into the experiences of reptile lovers from around the block and around the world. This is the Reptile Talk Podcast. What's going on, everybody? I'm Jeremy Turgeon from Brassman Reptiles. And I'm Rob, and I'm Creeping It Real. And this is what, episode six? Six, yeah, episode, episode six. six. We're deep in this now. Damn. <laughs> We're almost at ten. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today's episode is pretty freaking sweet. I am super excited to have on the guest we have on tonight. Do you want to tell him who we have on? <laughs> <laughs> so tonight we're going to be talking to Ryan Martinez, who is a zookeeper at Zoo Miami, and one of my good friends who I've known for uh, about a decade now. I don't know. He's pretty cool. So what's, what's up, man? How are you doing? What's up, guys? How y'all doing over there? We pretty good, man. are doing fantastic. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, jumping right into it, man, I mean, you seem to have done just a little bit of everything, so I guess we should start from, like, the beginning. What really got you into, like, unusual animals? Oh, man. Um, I mean, it it started long before I can even remember. You know, everybody like us kind of grows up around animals. I guess, for the most part, you grew up around them. Some people are introduced later on. Uh, People like us were into it. Yeah, yeah, people like us are from the beginning, you know, like from before you can remember. Um, my mom was always into animals, and my dad too, but my mom always had like turtles and, and stuff like that growing up, and um, like I was born in New York, but I grew up in Florida, and so there's all kinds of stuff running around, and uh, you know, I just grew up catching lizards and snakes in my backyard. It's funny, I, I actually grew up within visible distance of strictly reptiles, which I know you guys are familiar with. Oh, wow, um, that's awesome. <laughs> So you find so, all sorts so, of crazy stuff. All kinds of crazy things growing up. You know, I was catching in my backyard and just running the streets and, and doing stuff like that. So, you know, I was always into it. And then I grew up, uh, like, walking distance from this place called the Native Village. And you guys have probably heard me talk about it, mm-hmm. um, you know, on, on my post before. And probably mm-hmm. some of the other guys that you see on Instagram. Um, it was, you know, it was like a small local wildlife, you know, zoo. It was on, um, it was on Seminole property. And, uh. It just had all the cool stuff, you know, growing up, my mom would take me there. I had this little, like, pin that I had that would get me in free, so we'd go all the time. And then, awesome. uh, you know, I'd watch, like, watch the alligator wrestling shows and watch these guys handle, you know, venomous snakes and stuff like that. And I always just thought it was, you know, the coolest thing. And so when I was old enough, I started uh, volunteering there. And that's, that's really where everything sort of kicked off from. Like, that was ground zero for, you know, my animal career. So what was your, like, ambitions initially? Did you did you go straight for, like, ah, oh, man, I got to be a zookeeper? Or were you like, ah, oh, man, I want to do this thing? Or, like, because some people get into it and they're like, ah, oh, man, I just want to be a breeder. I want to breed all these millions of things. And then there's some people who are like, nah, I just want to do it for conservation. There's some people who it evolves and changes as they go. So, like, did, were you initially just like, man, I want to wrestle alligators? Or do you want to become a zookeeper? Or where, where were you at for that? Yeah, it's uh... – I didn't really have plans. I just wanted to be around animals. Like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just had to be with the animals, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I never really thought further than that. And so like when I started there, alligator wrestling was, was great. You know, it was a big thrill, you know, when you're in high school and all those hormones are raging, like that's like (laughs) cool stuff to do. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like it was just, it was the thing to do and, and I loved it, you know? And, um, I wasn't like into breeding or anything. Like I kept reptiles at home, but it was like, you know, one of these and one of that. And I wasn't like a, a breeder until after I started there, like way down the line when I started meeting like reptile people is when I got more into breeding. Um, yeah. But yeah, like the alligator wrestling thing was, it was cool for a few years. And then like the more I did it, <clears throat> the more I sort of like realized that I didn't actually enjoy it anymore. Yeah. And I sort of looked at it a little bit differently, you know, and, and the more I grew within my career, because that, that job obviously led to other jobs and then eventually to where I am now. Um, and so the, the more I grew through my career, like the more I realized, like, I can do a really cool alligator show without even touching the animal, Yeah. you know, because alligator wrestling, it's, I hate to say it, but it's about the wrestler themselves. Like, you know, it's sort of a man versus beast kind of thing. And, yeah, you know, yeah. you're, you're there to entertain the audience. Yeah, like a lot of people do, you know, education during their shows, but 
Um, most of it is, you know, your tips are based off of the tricks that you do and, and how close you come to getting bit. And, you know, so it's kind of about the person more than the animal. And as I got older and, and a little bit, you know, more experienced, I, I wanted to make my presentations more about the animal because alligators are, are incredible animals. We all love alligators growing up. If you like reptiles, you love alligators. And so I started to sort of switch um, from, you know, the show being about me to educating people about the actual animals themselves. And, and I, I found that it got a really great responses and I felt happier. You know, the animals are healthier at the end of the day. And so things definitely changed at, throughout the years as I sort of progressed through my career. That's awesome. Yeah. And we, yeah. We, we stopped by um, <laughs> Tom Crutchfield's place and he was mentioning how that he was changing as he's gotten older too. He said that like when he used to do alligator shows, it was all about, look at how tough I am and look at how, you know, I can make this animal do yeah. things and look at how fucking crazy I am. Um, yeah. But then, you know, as he's gotten older, he's like, you know, he's really admiring the people who are doing the shows now who aren't, like it's not a pitting against one another it's showing how smart they are and how you can train them and, and all the different things that they can learn it's showing that they're not just some like dumb mindless killing machine it's that they're you know like these magnificent creatures and i, yeah. I feel like the public's now just like ready to accept that because i feel like you know before people weren't ready to accept the idea that a lizard could be smart <laughs> Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, it's funny that you brought that up because in, in my original alligator wrestling presentations, I would actually talk about how an alligator is just like a frog with teeth. I was like, yeah, they're just, they don't have much going on upstairs and you know, they're not very bright. They're just instinctual. You know, they're really good at what they do, but that's about it. Yeah. And I was totally wrong about that. Alligators are incredibly intelligent, you know, mm -hmm. crocodilians in general and reptiles as we're, we're finding out more and more. Mm -hmm. I mean, every week I see something on Instagram where I'm like, Oh my God, that's, you know, incredible. It's yeah. some reptile showing some cognitive, you know, function. And, um, so yeah, as you sort of progress through that and see enough alligators and work with them long enough, like you're going to see that there is intelligence there. And so, there's a, a friend of mine, his name is John, um, Otter John, a lot of people know who he is. He kind of grew up around here doing the same thing, alligator wrestling, and I love watching his shows because he was he was always about the animal, and uh, he really knows, he's a really good animal trainer. Um, he's done a lot with, you know, otters and, and raccoons and cougars and stuff like that, um, but he, he does a lot with alligators as well, and he's still doing alligator shows, and I love watching him because he doesn't do a lot of wrestling. He might go in there, he might job hop once or something like that, but that's it. And the rest of the show is all about the animal and he can have them, you know, on verbal commands, just come up towards him and, and do something, and, you know, station and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, those guys at, at Wild Florida are doing the same thing. They're doing a lot of like station training and open mouth training and stuff like that. And I think that's really, really cool because it shows people that these animals are intelligent. You know, they, they are sentient and, and uh, they know what's going on. They can figure things out. And I think that's something that people need to see in order to appreciate those animals a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? That's so true. Yeah, it's not just some yeah. big dumb lizard. It's like, yeah, it's you can almost. It's like you you have to start to get people to equate an alligator to like their dog, <clears throat> right? You know, yeah. like something they can train, something they can have some kind of intellectual connection with. Otherwise, they're like, ah, it was awesome. It's a big lizard. Yeah. You know? Right. 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 Exactly. Because if they go to a show and they see, you know, I'm this guy and I just pulled this giant alligator out of the thing and then I, you know, grabbed its jaws and I'm wrestling it all over the place. So when they leave, they're remembering, Which, oh, yeah. this guy went crazy on this alligator. But if you go, <laughs> hey, this is our alligator, you know, so-and-so, uh, he knows his name and then call different names. And then as soon as you call his name, he knows it and he comes to you. That's like one of the craziest things yeah. that like blew my mind at Gatorland was – you know, uh, yep. Savannah would call to the alligator like by name, and that specific alligator would come up, and I was like, "Wow!" None of the yeah. rest of them would move, but that one knew. Like when it heard its name, it was like, "Boom, I'm there." That's it. Yeah, that stuff will blow your mind. Savannah is is amazing with the, the Crocs that she works with, and uh, yeah, like when you leave the old wrestling shows, you leave just thinking about how awesome or crazy you know that guy was. But when you leave, you know, the shows where people are educating about those animals and showing you, you know, their their mental function. Um, it's it's really mind blowing what these animals can do, and like you said, you know, Savannah calling individual alligators by name out of the water, and just that animal comes out, like mm -hmm. you know, that'll blow people's socks off. It's yeah. it's incredible, <laughs> you know. And, and then you get into things like Cuban crocodiles, which are like problem solving, Oof. like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole it's a whole different story, you know. So the scary smart ones, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, they really are. 
They really, really are. They're such cool creatures, though. So, like, um, you you started out, you know, working in, in those places and doing alligator shows and stuff like that. And then, you know, fast-forwarding a little bit to where you're at now, how did you end up getting to, to Zoo Miami? It, it's funny. Um, I'll tell you the whole story. Kind of interesting. I was working for, a, like, a science museum, like a kid's science museum for a little while, mm-hmm. just as a part-time job. Mm-hmm. And um, uh this was probably, this was right after high school or so, I was in college, and um, I had to go to court for something one day, I think it was like speeding tickets or something, I had to go to court, and uh, the court was right next to the museum that I was working for, so on my way home, I stopped by the museum, because at that time, the supervisor let me take rodents home to feed my own snakes, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I stopped by to grab some rodents to, to feed my snakes at home, and a couple of the people there were like, hey, we're, we're going to a conference down at, at uh, Metro Zoo, do you want to go with us? And I was like, oh man, I'd I would love to. I'm, I'm not really dressed for it. I had like a suit and tie on and everything. And this one guy was like, no, no, no. I, I got a t-shirt and gym shorts in my trunk. Like you can, you can wear that. Let's just go. And so I hopped in the car in these dirty clothes and, and we went to this conference <laughs> and, and it was every zoo from Florida. It was called phase it's Florida association of zoological educators. And, uh, there's all these zoos from Florida and everyone's in like these nice polos and they have oh, name boy. tags and stuff. And they're supposed so you to be there. Dressed for it. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I probably would have been better off wearing what I was. Yeah. Um, I sat there looking like a turn and, um, and it was the best meeting ever, man. I, I met a bunch of people. I had a really good time. I learned a lot and I met my buddy Willie. Um, this is the first time we met. It wasn't my buddy then, but we met and, um, <clears throat> he was working at the zoo. He was the one sort of helping put on the conference and, um, we just sort of hit it off, and, and eventually he was able to get me a job in education. Um, and then from there, I just did, like, internships within the zoo, got a keeper position, and then just sort of moved up from there uh, to where I am now. So it was, like, a series of really interesting events that kind of led to it. Um, but now that I'm here, I'm happy, and I, and I absolutely love what I do. I love the animals I work with. You know, it's a really great zoo. You guys were there, you know. The, my one though. regret for visiting was that we didn't take a whole day to check out the zoo because I was like, oh, we're going to go down there. We're going to check out these things. And then, you know, we'll go. I didn't realize how yeah. huge of a zoo that is because, yeah. like, yeah. it is easily double the size of every zoo in New England. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's massive. I think I don't want to spread false information, but I think we're one of the largest by, like, area um, in the country. You know, we're, we're a very large zoo. It's so much that, um, people like rent bicycles to go through the entire zoo like these, these four-wheel family bicycles <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's all they'll, they'll run people over and it's, <laughs> it's crazy but yeah like, it's a really big zoo <laughs> yeah it's crazy. It, like the the a lot of times the parents like lift their legs and the kids will just be the ones pedaling <laughs> like, oh this is so difficult and no no it's just in your mind just you got to pedal harder yeah right, right. it's in your mind yeah. exactly <laughs> Yeah, there's some good people watching there. But, yeah, it's, it's a really big zoo. It has a huge collection, and, um, you know, we do a, a lot of work for conservation. We breed a lot of, you know, really rare and endangered species, and um, we even do some, uh, like, repopulation projects. Um, which I know we have our, our Puerto Rican Crested Toad project that yeah. my friend Cindy works on. You know so Cindy. Cool. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I've yeah. known Cindy for a while, and, and she's, you know, I, those things are so freaking cool. I remember when she said yes. it, I was like, oh, man, those things are amazing. Yeah, they're super cool toads. She does a really great job with them, and then she gets to travel to Puerto Rico to release tadpoles and stuff. You know, that's uh, that's sweet. So yeah, cool. that's so awesome. Um, which is, you know, that's like real conservation work. Like they're, they're putting animals back into the wild. We're conserving the habitat that they have out there so that when we do release them, they have somewhere to live. And, you know, it's a really awesome thing. Um, we bring a couple other things like Guam kingfishers that go back for re-release and stuff like that. So there's a lot of really cool projects that, that go on over there. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, that's um, like, ah, uh, that's like the ultimate goal. It's just <laughs> to, to be able to do that, you know, like, I mean, you think about, like, any chance, any chance you get to breed or reproduce something is, is awesome. But when you have that greater goal of just, like, we're doing this and then we're, we literally get to the species. send this back, yeah, you know, yeah. to where it goes. That's, that's right. a whole other level. Yeah, it's super gratifying, you know, and, and uh, we even have some other frog projects, I think in Costa Rica, that we're, we're working on, too. Um, we do a lot of frog stuff. But, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's what you want to do. Like, we can breed things till we're blue in the face, and if they stay in, 
you know, human collections, like that's one thing, but to, to bring them back to where they belong is, is just, you know, incredible. Yeah, um, especially where so. they're conserving some of that habitat for them because there's a lot of people who get on captive breeding and they're like, oh, this is, you know, terrible. They should be in the wild. And it's like a lot of places they're losing that habitat. Like I want to go to Borneo and, and Sumatra and a lot of that habitat is just gone. Like the yeah. deforestation and, and palm oil and all this stuff. Yeah, but palm it's like, oil and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's gone. And, and to try and say that, that animal just like it needs to be in the wild it's like the wild's almost gone there, <laughs> there there's, yeah, there's hardly yeah. any of it left for these animals to survive and thrive on exactly i did that question thing on my story like last week or the week before and someone asked you know what's the best way to conserve species and, and I, like i had to think about it for a second but i was like you have to conserve their habitats their habitat. first yeah again you could you could bring them until you are blue in the face but if you have nowhere to put them like what's the point you know we, we got to protect the natural areas so yeah, that these animals so have a place to, to actually fucking live, you know. So, are we? Uh, I just dropped an f bomb. Are we cool with that? Yeah, we're cool, I mean, man. Oh, dude, we're so fucking cool. <laughs> we with are that fucking, fucking shit, with dude. it, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's it's something that that's like like I was saying with the alligator shows. I think that it's something that people right now are ready to hear. Because if you had told yeah. people in the 90s, well, hey, look, we need to save this forest right here uh, for these frogs, people would be like, get the hell out of here. we got to put up a Walmart. <laughs> fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah. They, they would be upset about it. And I think that just right. now people are starting to come to that realization that, hey, if we care about these animals, if we're saying, if we're telling people that we care about these animals, we also have yeah. to care about the areas where the animals live, not just about the individual animal itself but all the areas where they're found, all the places where they raise their yeah. young, all those different things play a role. What that animal eats, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if, if you're wiping out, a lot of people are like, oh, well, get rid of all the insects because insects are terrible. And it's like, you don't understand how many animals in an ecosystem yeah. rely on those insects to... The world runs on, on insects. Literally. Yeah. It's that true. Literally. So true. And, and it's like, yeah. it's, it's just a conversation that people are, or haven't previously been ready to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like other people would be like, oh, well, why are you like breeding, you know, toads? Like, what's the point of that? Nobody likes toads. Like, why wouldn't you breed something else like tigers and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. We do breed, you know, pure species tigers. Um, yeah. But like those, like those animals, like toads are, are vital to the ecosystems where they come from. They're food for other animals. They control other animals. They're indicator species. If something's wrong in that environment, you know, amphibians are usually the first ones to go mm -hmm. and they're going to tell you that there's something wrong here and we need to do something about it. And so, you know, you can't be choosy about which animals you, you know, want to repopulate the earth with. You, you have to do all of them and you have to start with, you know, from the bottom of the food chain and, and work up because everything relies on everything. It's all, you know, an interconnected web and we got to do what we can to protect that. So yeah, it's can't be choosy. I, I think that the yeah. indicator species thing is huge and, and that's something that people really should be focusing <clears throat> on because amphibians let you know when something's like crucially wrong before most other creatures will let you know amphibians are right there when you start seeing yeah. issues with your amphibian population you know that there's bigger issues that are about to come for everything else yeah exactly i exactly. think for the general public there's again that aspect of like there's the disconnect mm -hmm. between like ah it's me or the toad well fuck the toad yeah you know but and it's like, like that's right. not what it is and it's not <laughs> what it is yeah but and it's like the same with bugs yeah you know and yeah. like we were just talking about with the alligator shows like for most people it's like oh well it's a big lizard and it's on my private property i want to get rid of that fucking yeah. thing you know it's a nuisance right. but it's like actually it plays a huge vital part and if they no longer exist everything else is going to slowly start to fall apart and until yeah. that connection starts to happen with people you, you it, it's going to be that much harder i think one of the things that may actually help in the long run since it seems like these conversations are becoming a little bit more prevalent is as much as i don't want to talk about it this covid nonsense we've been seeing the articles kind of popping up here and there about how uh like um air flows and like certain currents have like kind of shifted back mm -hmm. a little bit right. to a more normal status um from just you know a month and a half of people not being outside yeah you know and in their cars and yeah. doing all this stuff so it's like if that you know continue if that trend kind of continues and you can see that literally worldwide hey because we all stopped being pieces of crap <laughs> for like a month and a half you know the, the earth yeah. started to heal itself a little, a little bit. bit you know maybe it'll get people's minds going a little bit you know of just being like one can hey help. you know at least to be able to initiate some new conversations yeah. about it yeah you know? 
I'm hoping it'll be a bit of an eye opener. You know, if we're if we're seeing those types of changes already, you know, in just what a month that we've yeah. we've been you know seeing changes. Um, you know, just imagine what we could see in a year or you yeah. know five years if we kept up with you know certain things. Um, exactly. So hopefully, hopefully it'll be an eye opener for for some of us. We can only hope. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh yeah. man. Okay, so I want to know. This is like I hate asking these questions, but after being at the zoo, I have to know what's like one of the top favorite species that you get the chance to work with. No, I like this question. This I, is a good I hate question. that question because I hate when people ask me, "What's your favorite snake?" I'm I like, have I a favorite. <laughs> I can never answer that effectively because I'll yeah. tell you what it is, and then three seconds later, I'll see something totally different and be like, "Oh, but that one's really That's cool, cool too." too. It's it's funny because if you if you look at like my posts or talk to my girlfriend like every animal is my favorite animal like yes. anytime I post like, this is this is one of my top favorite yeah. <laughs> it's like that with everything um, man it's such a hard question to ask because one we're a huge we have a huge collection and there's a lot of different animals in there and mm-hmm. we actually have some of my like some of my top favorite animals but um, I had the, the opportunity to work with the the cassowary which oh, is pretty cool yes, yes. Um, yeah. I'm mostly a reptile keeper but been doing you know work with her and, and that's that's my all-time favorite animal that is a, a dinosaur i don't care who you yeah. ask mm-hmm. yes like yeah, it's yes. a freaking dinosaur you know and yes. and uh working with that bird has been really really cool for me um i haven't worked with our giant anteaters but i really love giant anteaters i think they're just <sighs> fucking cool animals those are cool um you know we, we have some of those we have the uh, giant indian hornbills which i think are you know beautiful beautiful birds um i've had a chance to work on a very small amount with them um, and then of, of course the Komodos, I mean, yeah. you know, you guys, you guys saw the Komodos and they're absolutely incredible lizards. I know we talked about it before. Like I, I hate to say it. I do like croc monitors more than Komodos. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I wish we had croc monitors still. We, we had shipped out our last one like a year ago. Um, yeah. but the Komodos are, you know, they're right up there with them and, and they're just incredible animals going, you know, back to the intelligence thing. Like they're so smart. They mm-hmm. pay attention. They learn things so quickly. They recognize people. They have moods and, and they're just, you know, really neat animals. And those are probably the ones I work the most with. Um, the crocs, like we have them, and but we, we pretty much like leave them alone unless it's like feeding time. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the Komodos we actually get to interact with and, you know, I'll sit and watch them sometimes. And it's, it's just a, a totally different animal than like an iguana. And I'm not saying iguanas aren't intelligent, but they're just a different type of animal. Like, like the yeah. things that iguanas do during the day is different than what a Komodo is doing during the day. And the way they look at you is different process information is different so yeah the komodos are definitely a highlight for me like when i was a kid going to that zoo i never thought that i would like end up working with the komodos there but i would always run to that exhibit and, like look through the glass at them mm-hmm. like, you know, it's a fucking crazy lizard <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now here i am like you know i get to work with them every single day and it's uh it's definitely a dream come true so i guess like those you know those animals the cassowary and the komodo like that's the, the biggest one for me you know yeah. those have been the most rewarding and I was definitely yeah. geeking out when I saw the cassowary. Yes. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's so It awesome. is a dinosaur. Like, if you haven't seen one in it's, person, it is like, They're so much bigger in person. They're they huge. really are. They really, really are. They're huge, yeah. and they've got these talons, and, like, <laughs> it is a yeah. freaking velociraptor right in front of you. Like an yeah. oviraptor. And they're, yeah, like an oviraptor. And they're not timid. Like, like she'll kick you for sure if you go in with her. Like, <laughs> oh, that, yeah. It'll be game over. Like, it's it's not even a question, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very intimidating animal. You know, she stands up. She's taller than I am. And, uh, you know, that, that that ankle, you know, the ankle is as, as thick as my calf is. And, and that one, you know, inner claw is probably four inches or so. It's, it's mm. terrifying. Yeah. 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 I, I, I can't imagine like violent. walking around and just seeing one like if you're in the wild and you just happen upon a cassowary I'd be like okay gotta go yeah yeah like I, I follow some people from Australia and they'll, they'll post like a, a video of one just crossing the street and I'm like good fucking lord like that's just the, the craziest thing ever <laughs> just to watch that yeah I'll tell you like a, a really quick story that was like the weirdest thing for me I was driving out to the Everglades one time I don't know if you guys made it down to the National Park while you were here, um, no, but it's no, sort of near no, where yeah. Tom Crutchfields is. Mm-hmm. So it's like out, out in the middle of nowhere. There's these long roads with these huge like crop fields on the side. And uh, the sun was going down in front of me. So I was driving into the sunset. <clears throat> so everything that I was looking at was silhouetted like in black. Yeah. Because uh, the sun was on the other side of it. And there was, we have a lot of peacocks in Florida, like in South Florida. 
Like mm. there's just peacocks that run everywhere. And <laughs> there was this peacock on like a like a fence post on the right side of the road. It was silhouetted in black. And as I was driving up, it hopped down, ran across the road, and then disappeared into some crops. But the way that the sun was hitting it and the way that the tail feathers were, it looked like a velociraptor oh, running across the road. Oh. And I I like tripped the hell out. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Panic. Like, for a moment, like I was in Jurassic Park. It was, it was just the coolest thing. So, oh, you know, that's just a peacock. Like if I was to see a castle and do the same thing, I, I would absolutely <laughs> crash into the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> you got to figure was, like how many people yeah. don't realize that like that's what a peacock looks like running. Yeah. They see it and then they report <laughs> like, I saw a velociraptor. You can't tell yeah, me yeah, that it yeah. wasn't. <laughs> It was crazy. Like the tail was perfect, the head was bobbing, you know, and it was <sighs> like it was just moving like a like a velociraptor. And uh, it was Damn. the coolest thing. And that's like yeah. roughly about the size of a velociraptor, so like uh, Yeah, of an actual velociraptor. Yeah. Most not the movie ones, like the actual ones. Like, yeah. The ones in the movie, for anyone listening who has not researched this, uh, the ones in the movie are Deinonychus, is yeah. a, a larger species. Um, Velociraptor is a cooler name, but they're a, a smaller animal. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah, probably about the size of a peacock, like six feet long with the tail, maybe three feet long. Yeah, um, yeah. So the guy who's not a paleontologist, just a nerd. Yeah, right. Because I was like, oh man, Utah raptors, Deinonychus. Yeah. Oh, they're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was really neat. That was something else. So. That's crazy. Yeah. So you also do some like taxidermy stuff, um, and so I mean. I don't know if it's everyone, but I super, I'm super fascinated with taxidermy and like seeing things that are skin and all that different stuff. And a lot of people, yeah. I feel, feel like it, it kind of rubs them the wrong way, which like is just basically like, uh, kind of like a symptom of our system. People don't realize that their chicken at the grocery store comes from an actual bird. They don't know, like, you know, yeah. I, I feel like people see packaged goods or like live animals as different things. They don't see them as, as being the same thing, but I, sure. I have a huge fascination with that taxidermy. So have you always been interested in that sort of stuff or was it like something that you developed just being around stuff and seeing it? Um, I think it kind of goes back to like, you know, my childhood and the native village, like, uh, you know, you would find like a snake shed in your backyard and you'd keep it for a while. Cause that was like the coolest freaking thing. Um, you know, or something like that. Or when you go to the native village, um, they would find like the little alligator teeth because alligators, you know, crocodilians shed their teeth all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so they would like find them and give them to me. And as a kid, that's the coolest thing. And I always try to do that. You know, when I have like a kid that's really interested in asking good questions, like I'll find a tooth and give it to them or whatever. Same. Um, cause that was the stuff that like, really was impactful to me and so as i got older like i would collect more things you know as i spent more time out in the everglades you know or other places in florida you'd find like turtle shells that are all dried out stuff so i'd collect that and then <clears throat> getting into like the business like you know we work with live animals eventually they all perish you know nothing lives forever yeah and so i just wanted to see like what i could do with the animals that i was seeing you know being wasted because sometimes you know they'll just get buried or you know something like that and to me, that was that was wasteful. Like, there's still, you know, life to be had in that animal. So I, I just started researching like how to do, you know, the stuff that I do, skull cleaning and everything. And I went through a lot of trial and error. I went through several colonies of, of domestic beetles before I, I really figured out like what keeps them going, how to get them to eat things properly without things falling apart, mm -hmm. how to clean it and stuff like that. So it's been it's been like a work in progress for years, and I've had a lot of people, you know, help. There's a lot of, you know, good resources online. You can reach out to people that are really cool about it and we'll talk to you. Some people, like, closely guard their secrets. They'll never tell anyone because they think they're <laughs> yeah. the only one in the world that does it. Um, but there's, you know, been a few people out there that, that are really cool about it. And uh, it's it's all been trial and error, you know, and, and listening to them and seeing what works for me. Because what works for, like, someone here in Florida where it's, like, hot and humid doesn't work for someone who's in Wisconsin or, you know, somewhere right, else right. where it's a little bit different because the Beatles are kind of picky about you know, the, the conditions that they live in. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun though. Um, and it's crazy to see what people have in their freezers. Right. Uh, I'm, right. <laughs> I'm like Goodness. that guy that shows up and they're like, Hey, you want to see my collection? I'm like, no, nah, I want to see your freezer. Like, yes. What's, what's in there? Oof. Yeah. Yeah. But seriously, like it, it, it's crazy because everywhere where there are live animals, there's also dead animals too. Um, yeah. and, and you know, if you can give that, animal a second life if you can allow it to be used because like we have a big common snapping turtle shell and we've had it at the store for years and years and years and years and years probably like 15 years or something mm -hmm. but 
it was just kind of like around. No one really used it. And then yeah. when I started doing shows and tours at Nerd, I was like, why aren't we using this? This is a great tool to teach people about the inside of turtle shells so they can realize yeah. that it's not just like a hermit crab shell where he just ditches it. It's like part of his body. And right, right. when people see that, when they can see the inside of a turtle shell and see, oh my God, that's its ribs, that's its backbone. I have a ri- I have ribs, I have a backbone. It's just like me. It's not all that different. It allows them to kind of connect to that animal and helps them understand it better because I would often see people being really rough with tortoises. Like they go up and they pick them or they'll like knock up on, knock on their shells or whatever. But if you show them, Hey, look, this is its back. If you're knocking on its back, it's like someone knocking on your forehead. You should respect it. People can kind of put one and one together when they can get a chance to see it. But if you don't have those tools, if you're not utilizing those tools, it's tougher for people to kind of understand. Absolutely. And that actually reminds me, I used to do a lot of sea turtle work um, for the museum that I worked at. And I used to do these programs um, at the museum before we went to the beach and, and did like sea turtle nesting surveys and stuff. And I would always use this giant loggerhead sea turtle shell. I mean, this thing weighed like 50 pounds. It was, you know, it's just, Damn. Damn. just thick. It was solid. It was huge. Um, and I would talk to people about it cause I had this, I had this crazy PowerPoint with all these slides, you know, about uh, turtles and traps and turtles mm-hmm. getting butchered for their shells and, and stuff like that. And, um, it would, it would always hit home with people. But when I showed the shell, I would show the front at like the top of it first. Um, and then I would flip it around so they could see the spine and ribs inside um, while there was a slide in the background of like turtle shell bracelets or something like that. And that always got people when they realized like the turtle is attached to it. Like it is a part of them. It grows with them from when they're a baby. Like that always drove the point home. And uh, it was a really great tool. Like I'm big on using biofacts in my presentations um, Same. when yeah. I still did presentations. I think they're, you know, a, a really useful tool. Like you can bring a live animal and that's great. But if you don't have the ability to do that, or you bring both, you know, bring a live animal and bring, you know, a, a dead counterpart, um, for lack of a better word. Like, that's a really cool way to, to show things that you might not be able to show with the live animal. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I just, I really love that. So that's yeah, I try to do the same show. thing. And then like, I'll say if I get a full mm-hmm. shed from a snake, I'll save it. So that if I get any kids, yeah. like you were saying, any kids that are like super enthusiastic or like, you know, are super into reptiles, I can be like, here, take this, this shed skin. You can have this really cool and you can see the pattern on it and stuff. But that's yeah. the sort of stuff that keeps that, you know, fire burning for those kids to to keep yeah. continuing educating themselves about those animals. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. When I was a kid, like, my dad took me over to one of his motorcycle friends, like, houses. And the guy had Burmese pythons. Um, this is back in, like, the 90s when, when everybody had them. And, uh, yeah, he gave me, <laughs> like, Rob's a shed. favorite that, snake. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, that shed was on my wall. From that time, I was, I don't know, six, seven years old until, like, I graduated high school. Like, that was there forever, that shed. It's covered in dust and it's falling apart at some parts. (laughs) But, like, that that shed, like, kept me going. Like, I thought that was the coolest thing. And and, uh, it was probably only from, like, a a 12-foot snake or something like that. But to me, it was huge. It was absolutely massive, you know? And uh, that was, you know, just the coolest thing. So, yeah, like, I I always try to reach out. You know, if, if a kid has really good questions, he's really into it and, and uh, you know, thinking about things, really excited. Like I always try to give them a little something because that's the the stuff that really sparked me when I was a kid and, and that kept me going. And I think yeah. you got to keep doing that. Yeah, I wish I had a place like uh, you know there was more into reptiles around me when I was a kid because my n- nearest reptile store was like forty five minutes away, oh, and man. my local pet store was like the dude was afraid of reptiles, so he had like an iguana, a leopard gecko, and anoles, and that's pretty much it. He didn't usually care right, too right. much as far as reptiles went, so I didn't get a lot of that like exposure to reptiles. I had one guy come to my birthday party and do like a reptile. Uh, program kind of and his rainforest reptiles who like now I've worked with Mike Rogalski a bunch of times and he's a, he's like one of my uh, you know colleagues so to say so so to say he's come yeah. and talked on behalf of educational programs with us in Maine and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut and he's like a great guy but he was like one of the only experiences I had when I was younger with really bigger snakes like I, I just knew people who had garter snakes and like one person who had a yeah, boa yeah. and like not <laughs> didn't get a lot of experience hands-on experience when I was a kid just because I didn't or in New England there's not a whole lot for that which is why I like that we get so many people coming into nerd and zoo creatures to do tours and get hands-on with pe- with this animals 
And when I was working in the pet store, one of the big things that I loved doing was talking to people and find out who was afraid of snakes and try to get them to take the tour. Because yeah. at the beginning of the tour, they're terrified, and then by the end, they're holding ball pythons, and they have an appreciation for those animals. Yeah. One of my yeah. favorite things that you do when people walk in the store is be like, Giant Vietnamese centipede? Oh, yeah. Huh? Anybody want one? Huh? That's my favorite thing to like, do with the pet stores. No. Whenever people come into the store, I always like, hey, how you doing? You looking for anything specific? And then I'm like, oh, you're the person that was asking to buy the giant Vietnamese centipede. And people have one of two reactions. Either one, they're like, yes, I was here looking for centipedes. Or two, they're mortified down to their core. And they're like, nope, wasn't me. No, thank you. And I'm like, but do you want to see it? And they're like, uh. Okay, yeah, I'll go. To, I'll look at it, but don't take it out. I'm like, I'm not gonna take it out. Let's go look at it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I always, I always loved reading your stories on Facebook. Um, you know, when you'd have someone come in that that had like a, you know, impactful interaction with you. You know, I'd, I would always read those stories. I'm like, man, that's that's just awesome because I, I love seeing stuff like that, and and especially in a place where you guys are, where there's not a lot of uh, you know animal places. Like growing up in South Florida, there is animal places on every corner. Like yeah, you're yeah. surrounded by it, but up there you don't have that, and so you guys take that opportunity to get everybody, you know, who walks through those doors to appreciate, you know, something in the store. Whether it, maybe it's not everything, but one thing that they c- came in hating or disliking, and then they leave, you know, having a better appreciation for it. Like I, I sure. love when you guys do that. So I always love reading your, uh, your accounts of those, uh, those tales. Yeah, that's like one of the most satisfying things of, of of working there is getting to teach people about them, and it's it's so funny because. We do a lot of like birthday programs where we'll have, you know, a kid who comes in for a birthday party, but he brings his whole family and all his friends. So inevitably there's like two people who are like, I'm only here because I love this kid. And I'm like, well, guess (laughs) what? By the end of this program, you're going to at least tolerate these animals. (laughs) You're going to love Indian ornamentals. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I get a lot of people who specifically request, they're like, no spiders, sorry, not. And I'm like, well, I've got spiders tattooed all over me, so you're going to have to be okay with at least seeing a spider because I'm going to talk about them. Just a little bit. Or for those programs, yeah. I like to like bring in hissing cockroaches or something that's not a spider, but like close enough where also people are like, "Oh, that's call. so Dude, creepy." Hissing cockroaches are like the best educational tool. They're so awesome. at, oh, at yeah. the museum that I mentioned earlier, like hissing cockroach was the first animal you handled, and yes. like that was that was like your initiation, you know, because everybody was always like, "Oh, I don't want to handle that." To me, it was no big deal, but like seeing other people that were in my animal handling class you know react to that i was like wow this is actually a a big deal yeah and then they overcome it and then they get to do that to other people where they're like no 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 no. like check this thing out it's actually really fucking cool and uh like that that was one of my favorite educational animals anytime i would do a reptile show to school i'd also bring a madagascar hisser because i just think you know they're the best and great because you bring like like five or six and let a kid hold them and they're just like freaking out but it's awesome at the same time yeah Yeah, and there's no risk of them really getting hurt because like the first thing people ask is like is it gonna bite me and i'm like well they don't bite they don't sting they have like little barbs in their legs so if you try to like grab them they might poke you with their legs but there's no venom they don't you know they're they're harmless right right they're herbivores and and just getting to see people get over that is is pretty cool yeah for sure yeah 100 percent uh, I was just going to say something. I completely forgot what it was. Oh, we had a, a lady one time that requested no turtles at her party, what? at her daughter's what? party. She was like, absolutely no turtles. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I, I always start with a box <laughs> turtle or something like that. Like, like people love – how do you not love a turtle? I've never met anyone that met a turtle and afterwards was like, I'm good. Like, <laughs> turtles are cool. So I brought one in a box, and I, uh, I did the majority of the presentation – and then I, I specifically, I, like, I kind of wanted to gauge the crowd and see, like, you know, how are we all feeling? Yeah. And everybody seemed pretty cool. So I, I asked the mom, I was like, listen, I brought a turtle. I want to bring it out. I think everyone's going to be all right with it. And she, she agreed to it, and everybody loved it. It was, like, not a big deal at all. So I don't know what their interaction was with turtles before. Sure. I don't know if it was, like, that turtle from Family Guy or whatever. But, um, <laughs> you know what it probably what was? About. It's probably the kid was like, I want a turtle. I want one so bad. And they're like, if this kid sees an actual turtle in person, I'm going to have to get a turtle. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you might be right. That's like the only thing I could think of. You yeah. Because I, I feel like, like that I, is so benign. It's I like, feel like she said she was scared of him, but I don't remember. That was a long time ago. Yeah. But yeah, that was I'm afraid of moving shells. <laughs> <laughs> it's a turtle. 
<laughs> like turtles are the best, man. Yeah, yeah. Like huge. of doing all my years of programs, I think that was like probably the most popular program or program animal that I had because you can bring yeah. out. I brought blood pythons. I brought tiger rat snakes. I brought like leopard geckos, crusty geckos, all these different animals. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter what. Like, a lo- I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but people were into some <laughs> of the other things. Chameleons are cool, but mm-hmm. if people can see a turtle in person, yeah. and then like if you can, like if you have an aquatic turtle and you like show that it can flip itself over off of its back, whoa! Right, people right. lose their minds. Yeah. They're yeah. like, whoa! They go ape shit over that stuff. We yeah. used to do that with the box turtles. We'd flip them over and, and they'd flip themselves back, and people were like cheering and clapping. Yep. And... Every single time <laughs> I do... Do, when I do the tours, I do that with a snapping turtle, and people are like, oh, oh, it's so yes, yeah. that's the best it's thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's so <laughs> awesome. We used to do uh, these things called turtle races. So we would get like hula hoops or these like big giant hoops that we would make with like rope or something. Yeah. You get everybody on the ground like kneeling around the edge of the hoop, and then you put like a box turtle, um, a slider of some sort, and a gopher tortoise in the middle, you know, and just let them go and see who reaches the edge of the ring first. <laughs> and you'd have like like people cheering for each turtle, like slapping the ground, just screaming their minds out, like oh! <laughs> just like so fucking excited for these turtles and they're just walking around you know and, and it was just like the best and people would get so into it and then you just talk to them about turtles after and, yep. and they sit and they listen and they love them and it's, it's just amazing so yeah. awesome. moral of the story turtles fucking rule yeah and, turtles uh, are the best 100 <laughs> yeah show army for life <laughs> yeah Oh man, it's awesome. But yeah, it's just, it's just like the way that you get to people is let them kind of interact because it's one thing for people to see a turtle, but if they can get close to it or even pet it, that like that changes yeah. people. It's, yeah, absolutely, hundred percent, man. When I yeah. remember uh, when I was working at when I was volunteering at one of my local zoos in Western Mass, like we had this like massive boa constrictor that mm-hmm. was probably morbidly obese oh yeah 100 you know, percent. um <laughs> but uh it was like the nicest boa like you literally just pick it up and it's like what up bro you know yeah. and like that's it you know so like when we would go and do like <laughs> probably didn't have the muscle mass to do anything yeah else. exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly um but you know so we'd take that to like the summer camp presentations mm-hmm. or whatever and like people are like oh my god big snake and then they just see it kind of like plopped there and they're like oh it's not that bad you know yeah. Like, yeah you can come and touch it and everything and like that that like physical interaction is such a, a, a necessary tool to get that switch to go off you yeah know, from because I mean again like you're just saying just looking at it is one thing but and you know to me it's like well you could just look at it on TV too mm-hmm. you know you don't even yeah. need to be at a zoo or something like that you know um, yeah. So it's like there's like that incremental step. It's like okay, saw it on TV, cool. Saw it in a person, zoo, yeah. okay, cool. That's actually a lot bigger than I thought. And then being able to then touch it, it's yeah. like ah, it has been completed, and now I love this creature. You know, yeah, that's so that brings vital. up a, another point. It's like you have to, you got to pick the right animals for presentations like 100%. that. When it's people yes. that are potentially nervous around them, like like I know some people that'll do a show and they'll go and grab like a like a wild. I don't know, rat snake the night before or something like that. And then, it, you know, or they'll bring like a, like a crazy Spilotes or something. Not that all Spilotes are crazy, but like they'll bring like something crazy because they want to like show off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like blowing, yeah, yeah. It, blowing it in its face and making it shriek at them and stuff. And you, you just watch people like horrified. And that like that sends the wrong message. You know, yeah. you bring something calm and, and manageable and, uh, you know, ease people into it so that they can, you know, get over their fear. You don't want to show them you know, a reason to be fearful for you know any sort of reason. You know, uh, in our native village shows, we we would do like a venomous snake show, but we'd always start with a non-venomous, and we would make it bite us every time. We'd put it on our thigh and then put our forearm like on top of it and kind of smush it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it was usually like a water snake, some sort of neurodia or something like that. Um, and we would make it bite us so that we could show people like what a non-venomous bite looks like compared to a venomous. It was like the most ridiculous thing. But it, it never really got reactions. Like, it just made people uneasy. And, yeah. and, like, some people would run away. And I just stopped doing it after a while. I was like, this is not, like, not getting – It's not helping at all. Exactly. Um, and so I, I always appreciate when people, like, choose the right animal. Like, you don't want to bring, uh, let's say, a coming eye to a, a birthday party that's going to yeah. be totally unmanageable and bite someone's yeah. face yeah. off. Yeah. That you know, could be, like, I mean, that could also be a really fun birthday. That's I'm just saying. That's for the people who have all their own reptiles. <laughs> right, right, right. 
<laughs> That's right, the right. special birthday party. <laughs> yeah. But when it's, you know, a family that just has like a dog or a cat, they're yeah. not really reptile people, but they yeah, kind of yeah, want to yeah. see them because it's something different. Like, you know, bring a ball python or whatever it is that you're going to bring that's manageable and, and, you know, comforting for them. Yeah. Not something not something crazy that you're going to have to wrestle or you might get out of your hands. Like, yeah. I, I've definitely <laughs> had, <laughs> I've had my miss outs during these presentations. I've done probably thousands of them, but mm-hmm. I never intentionally brought. Uh, animals like that um, for classroom presentations you know yeah. that i had to like battle with yeah uh, yeah i think that one of our most popular animals, animals on our tours that we do at nerd is i've got a couple different leucistic ball pythons just all white with the blue yeah. eyes and yeah, yeah. all of their names are marshmallow and right. people fall in love with marshmallow because they're like i know what yeah. a marshmallow is marshmallows don't hurt you and then i hand right. them this all white snake and they're like oh my god it looks just like a marshmallow it's puffy and white and it's cute yeah. and every i have people that come back and do the tour like every weekend just to hang out yeah. with marshmallow just yeah and they ask for it by name right yep 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. every time that gets people we had a like an albino berm named lemon you know yep. and, and people would ask for that that berm you know year after year i would go to schools did you bring lemon this year and it's like you know that's really cool because that that animal made an impact that lasted you know not a couple of days not a couple of hours it's you know years yeah yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we have a s- albino berm called scrambled scrambled eggs because he's yellow and white and people love that nice stuff. they love yeah it. yeah yeah i think everyone's fallen in love with an albino berm at some point in their life like you know that was just like the thing the big yellow snake yeah. The big yellow snake. Always. Rob's never <laughs> fallen in love with a Burmese I'm, python. I'm morally ever. opposed to Burmese pythons. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> Rob's like, check out this albino blood. I'm like, it's look just at any as other fat, thing. but twice as likely to lose its mind. Yeah. You know what the best is that I, I loved bringing for a while to, to schools were the uh, European legless lizards. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. The Pusics or whatever. Yep. You pull one of those out and people are like, snake, immediately, you know? Yep. yep. And it's so cool when you tell them that it's a fucking lizard. They're like, no, get the hell out of here. Like, <laughs> people are losing their minds. Like, I don't believe you. Straight yeah. up. And then you, you show them, like, it blink. And, yep. <laughs> like, that's it. Or it has ears and, and they just fucking lose it. And it's, it's the really the coolest thing. <laughs> For sure. People don't even know those things exist. <laughs> yeah. yep. There's so many really cool animals for that stuff. Yeah, I, th- I think that cool. as people are getting mm. better at keeping things and keeping them alive and keeping them well, I think that there's going to be that need for more unusual animals and programs because, like, you know, everyone – when I bring – when I do a regular program at a birthday party or something, I usually bring a variety of things that – most of them may have seen. I bring like leopard geckos, I bring crested geckos, I bring some bearded yeah. dragons, I bring a tortoise, a chameleon, some ball pythons and things like that. And as more people are keeping reptiles and it's like becoming more almost like mainstream, you know, almost yeah. at every party I do, someone's like, oh, I know somebody with a bearded dragon or, you know, my right, school right. had one or, or this mm-hmm. or the other thing. And so that's why I gear a lot of my information more about like where the animal comes from, why it is the way it is, the way that it's shaped the way it is or has scales or whatever. And so people can kind of learn a little bit more background about it. But as I'm doing more programs, I'm getting people who are like, no, I've seen all of those things. What do you have that's not those? And I've had some really cool birthday parties where, you know, it's like 25 or 30 year olds and I'm doing birthday parties for them. And they're like, okay. I've got a blood python, a jungle carpet python, a couple ball pythons, and a Burmese python. Show me something different. And I like those right. programs too because I can bring out something that's a little bit more unusual and talk right. about stuff that I don't usually get to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen a Lucy King? How about now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or a Boland's python or you know, something crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I have brought Boland's pythons at birthday parties before yeah. uh, for people who have got a bunch of their own reptiles and stuff, and, and that one always right. really gets people. And, yeah. yeah. Remember that? We had somebody snake. call to do a private tour with Kev, and they are like, uh-huh. I specifically want to see Boland's pythons. Yes, yep. <laughs> right. I've had people, yeah. That was the request. He was like, I don't need to see anything but Boland's pythons. We're like, really? We'll make it happen. <laughs> You're going to come here just for the just for the Bolins out of That's everything all. that we have? Ju- okay, cool, bro. That's like, fine. <laughs> I guess the, I, I feel like jaded almost because I've been working with Bolins pythons for like eight years now. So they're, right. when I see them, I'm not like, oh, wow, look at that thing. I'm like, oh, it's a Bolins python. Its cage is pooped because they poop every 10 minutes on the <laughs> on the dot they poop. 
<laughs> and they like to smear it everywhere. True? And I'm like, why do you do this to me? They, they do poop a lot a compared lot. to many other Compared to everything. Species. They're like wow. a Kribo. They poop so wow. much. <laughs> yeah, that puts it into perspective because Kribo shit everywhere. They're just non-venomous <laughs> cobras. Yes, you know? they, yeah. exactly. They they and are it's just like over. that. So when wow, people are like, I need to see a Bolins python, I'm like, Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, I guess. Hey, give me, give me five minutes. I gotta clean it off. Yeah, I gotta wipe yeah. it off Covered because it likes the poop and then slither through it. Sorry. <laughs> that's so crazy. I did not know that about them. Yeah, I, that's one of the their well hidden secrets is that they're yeah. they're basically just creepos. <laughs> <laughs> just wait till the word gets out. <laughs> oh god, that's so that's cool. Crazy. So you have had a, a lot of different kinds of reptiles and you've got some amazing barons racers which are so freaking cool yes um do you feel like your perspective on keeping has changed over the last couple of years or uh, as your career has gone on do you feel like your perspective on keeping them has changed a lot yeah definitely like uh specifically the past few years but like really within the past year i've really taken a step back to look at you know how i'm keeping my animals and everything and um like i i was when I first got my venomous license, like I went absolutely ape shit. I had cages from floor to ceiling, you know, <laughs> I had, I had venomous everywhere. I was working for strictly um, around that time. So I, I got to cherry pick all the shipments that came in. Yeah. I was like, I'll take one of those, I'll take <laughs> of those. Like, you know, everything. And I, I had so much stuff and I just got so overwhelmed with it. You know, I wasn't able to appreciate, I couldn't even see half of them because I had, you know, racks and vision cages stacked on top of each other and, um, you know, it'd take me forever. It'd probably take me two days to go through and feed everything just because there's so many. And, and I just wasn't appreciating them. Like I saw them when they came in, you know, I'd see them when I'd open the tub and that was it. And so like, I started scaling back a lot. And as I started working for the zoo, like I saw, you know, these big habitats that we can make that are, you know, bioactive, you have, you know, waterfalls and, and live plants and stuff like that. And, and the more I've traveled to other countries and seen like animals that I keep in the wild, mm-hmm you know, doing their natural thing in these huge open spaces. I'm like, wow, like I could be providing so much more for my animals. And we're starting to see the reptiles respond to enrichment a lot more. So, um, you know, I've, I've taken a step back. I've thinned, thinned down my herd a bunch. I've, you know, just started to keep things that I, I really, really enjoy and just trying to set them up as, as big and, and, you know, as natural as I can. And, uh, you know, I, I try to keep things, different for them i try to give enrichment just like i would at the zoo you know um and i you know savvy does the same thing for her animals and uh like i don't know if you guys saw on her story yesterday she had hung up a bunch of like red meat for the for the monitors and everything to kind of Mm -hmm. pull on and stuff like i think that's hugely important you see these people walking around with you know huge fat boa constrictors or or big just bloated savannah monitors and stuff like that Mm -hmm. they're like yeah check out how big and chunky my savannah is like it looks nothing like it would in the wild it's a balloon yeah you know yeah. it's not healthy it doesn't have energy it doesn't have muscle it's you know so so i've really been trying to take a step back and, and give my animals you know my few animals the care that they really really need and deserve and just try to i've been trying to get other people to do the same as well like i you know i i get the whole rack thing i get having a huge collection and it it definitely works for some people but um you know i've really just started to enjoy watching my animals more and watching them interact with the habitat and and the enrichment that I give them. And I think that's so rewarding. Like I kind of lost that rewarding feeling of when I was a kid and I had one bearded dragon that I would spend all my time with, mm-hmm. you know, like, like hand feeding it crickets and watching it just like run around its enclosure and bask and stuff. Like it went from that to keeping a shit ton of things in little enclosures on newspaper um, to, you know, now I'm, I'm trying to build big habitats and, and just provide as much as I can. Hell yeah. So, I, I yeah, think that, there's like this huge shift happening right now in the reptile like hobby and there's some people who think that if you aren't doing it one way you're just like the worst person in the world and i think that Mm -hmm. it it definitely depends on what sort of animal you're keeping and and what your goal is with those animals to right to really feel fulfilled because you know, it's it's one thing to have, you know, full bioactive enclosure and to 
have these animals in like full light lit displays and all this sort of stuff but there's some animals that just like oh i'm not really cool with that like my, yeah. blood pythons and oh, short tails are like one of my favorites and they're an animal like if you want to do bioactive you'd have to have like a eight or ten foot enclosure for one animal to right, feel right. happy and to be able to like do it properly and it's just like yeah. not practical for most people but then there's like yeah lots of push for bioactive and like gecko i think the gecko hobby and like the frog hobby their ability to go crazy with the bioactive stuff is like unparalleled to like just about anything else in the hobby i think that they've they've hauled this potential and i like the the changes that i'm seeing when I, that i see with them yeah absolutely man yeah the definitely like the amphibians and even some of the invert people and stuff and, mm-hmm. and geckos like you said like they're getting really crazy with their habitat there's all sorts of new, you know, products coming out on the, on the market that are just awesome for those sorts of things. And, and I've seen some beautiful, beautiful setups. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody should be keeping bioactive. Like what I'm saying is, is like, if you choose, if you're, if you're like, all right, I'm going to get monitors, you know, let's say you want to get a water monitor or whatever, like, don't just keep that animal in a six foot vision and be like, well, that's the biggest cage they make. That's, you know, I'm doing the best I can, Yeah. you know, like, like build something, you know, if you're going to go in for it, like, you do have it. to yeah you, you know, have to build something custom build them something yeah it's got to be custom you got to give them space to to be the lizard that they are exactly um, same thing with retics like i'm not going to mention any names but there's people that breed thousands of retics every year mm-hmm. you know and in every color under the sun but like where are those animals going are they just going into racks mm-hmm. are they going into six foot visions like you know an 18 20 foot retic is a really big snake and they're a yep. lot more active than people think. Like, I always heard the excuse, like, oh, yeah, you know, these big snakes, like, they'll curl up in one spot in the wild and they'll live there for months at a time just waiting for food to come to them. But if you ever watch a retic on, like, in the wild or in a really big exhibit, they're, they're super active snakes. They're, yeah. they're almost like Kribos. Like, they're moving. They're exploring things. You know, we had a, a big retic enclosure at the village, and there was a telephone pole in the middle. Uh, or it was a palm tree or something like that, but it was a, a straight pole right in the middle. Yeah. And every day at the same exact time, that retic would climb it in that. Have you ever seen them climb like a straight oh, yeah. pole in yeah, that, yep. that crazy fashion? Yeah, they do that uh, that amazing thing. And then he would go to the top, coil around it, and bask in that spot every day. And then he'd come down and he'd go and cruise around his waterfall and, and back around and, and coil up. And so they use a lot of space. And I think you have to provide that for them, you know? And so I just, uh, I want to see more people pushing for that and i i do i definitely like have noticed more people are getting excited about building big things you know and uh and trying different things out and and seeing what they can get away with um trying different enrichment and stuff like that and and it's it's really making me happy and and proud to see a lot of people going that way i'm 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 really curious to see where the future goes because i think that as things change and progress you know, in, in our lifetime, the hobby has progressed and changed so much. So like, much. Oh, yeah. An insane amount. Like, an unbelievable yeah. amount of change has happened. And just yeah. to think about where it's going to go in the next 5 to 10 to 20 years is like, I can't even imagine where it's going to go. Yeah. It's yeah. nuts. I agree. Um, did you see, uh, Ryan, I don't know if you follow Steve Tillis at all. Um, no, I'm not familiar. Oh, he's, uh, he's up in the Gainesville area in Florida. Um, but he was just designing uh, some new spacers and stuff on like oh, Freedom racks, Breeder yeah. racks, so that you could essentially like double the height of like a, a CB70 rack or something, and like the space between the bins, and cage. essentially turn them into cages. Yeah. Um, oh, so, wow, you, okay. uh, so you offer some more uh, space to them. And he had just posted a photo on his story the other day. He His like a, his first prototype was done, mm-hmm. and he was able to uh-huh. get a cage insert that was probably I think so what, like 16 by 33 by like 12 inches tall. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. And then that, uh, the bin that's underneath it then becomes you can make that like four and a half inches of just straight bedding. Yep. You know, so if you want to do wow. that bioactive aspect, like you can then do that because you can put that much bedding in there and there's still plenty right. of space for whatever you're going to keep in there. So his thought process is to be able to do that with like even some of their larger bins. That's like the one that I saw. Yeah. It was what his double wide yeah. tubs. Yeah. So that cool. was, you that was really interesting. That one. Yeah. He's, he's just like, he's just using a 3d printer mm-hmm. and just creating these inserts that can go in and, and expand each level. You know, and wow. I was like, dude, that's that's freaking genius. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, yeah. you just outfit the front with a frame so you can put a door on it. Yep. And you're pretty much good to go. And I was that's like, cool. 
That's badass. Yeah. And then <laughs> yeah, just... we need that that innovative sort of uh, you know move. We need people thinking about things like that. Like, what can we do with what we have already, or what can we change and move forward with? Exactly. And I'm looking at other away. parts of the like animal keeping hobby hobby, and there's like the the fish people are like light years ahead of reptile people. <laughs> oh, and <yeah. laughs> I'm watching these guys. I was like literally was just curious one day, and I was like looking at different things, and they've got things that auto check your salinity for your water, your pH, and like auto top yeah, offs, and they've got these things that like create light cycle so like it slowly ramps up your lights during the morning so it's not like boom, yeah. the lights are on it's like a slow, a slow like natural like sunrise sunrise that's and then they've got yeah. the same thing at the end of the day and then they can have it so it's like a lightning storm and all this stuff and i'm like you know what reptile people have a thermostat that works most of the time <laughs> and it's like are you kidding me <laughs> but it's just i think that like it's just right looking angle. at where yeah. it could go i think there's this huge potential for change going on in the future yeah, sure. I think that I think that stuff is hugely important. Like, there's a, a guy in Florida that uh, keeps pangolins, and yeah. um, he has like a, a whole thing set up on an iPad where you can do like rainstorms within the enclosures to you know stimulate breeding and like you said with the lights coming on you know low at first and then building up slowly. Like that stuff is you know next generation. The fish people are already doing it. You know all those those guys are doing it. I think it needs to come into the reptile world because. You know, life cycles are hugely Huge. important to, to yeah. reptiles. A mm -hmm. lot of people don't realize that. They're like, why isn't my animal breeding? You know, I've done everything else right. Uh, it's like, well, you have it in a room with, you know, no windows and the light's on 24 hours or it has no light or, you right, know, whatever. Right. It's just a heat pad. Like, yeah, those, you know, that circadian rhythm, rhythm is, is very important. And uh, I think as we start to explore things like what those fish guys are doing, we're going to find that, you know, animals that were impossible to breed, you know, throughout the years that people just, are like nope, that species is tough to breed. I'm not going to work with it. Like we might actually be able to figure them out and and start producing, and I think that'd be really cool. Hell, yeah, uh, very true. Yeah, man. All yep. right, so we're reaching just about our time. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you. I usually ask people this towards the end, or we ask people this at the end of the podcast. Is there anything going on? in the realm of reptiles or you know exotics any sort of that sort of stuff that gets you excited right now for the future is there is there something that's going on right now it doesn't have to be like a, a more for a specific species or anything like that anything in particular that's got you excited about you know reptiles oh man that's such a hard question i know <laughs> like i i you know spending my time in quarantine i've just been scrolling through instagram every day seeing things that i'm like well that's awesome um, yes. just, it's hard to like keep track of what's going on but um, fuck. I might have to write in later with my answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just I love seeing people, you know, breeding species that are that are critically endangered. Um, like I'm good friends with a lot of people that that breed like radiateds and galops and stuff like that. And and mm. I just I absolutely love that stuff. One tortoises are the, are the best. And you know when you have these people breeding, you know the right subspecies to the right subspecies and making sure that the lineages are you know not overlapping and stuff like that like i i just think that's really cool it's a lot of work that goes into it you know making sure you know where your animals came from and what they're related to and everything and, and uh to keep that stuff going is you know hugely important um like i said i'm gonna have to think about that because there's there's a lot of cool things i don't want to leave anybody out there's so much cool shit going on no i know um, i feel you i'll have to i'll have to write it to you guys later cool but that's a good question so if people want to find more about you where should they go uh i actually just have an instagram for now that's um, where it's at keeping so, it simple yeah you know <laughs> zookeeper underscore ryan that's me um, i'm always down to talk to people about anything you know i answer questions all the time and you know i enjoy talking to people and, and about anything really if it's animals that's great if it's other stuff that's cool too but um yeah everybody can reach out to me on instagram you know I'm pretty friendly, I think. I mean, <laughs> me and Rob have known each other online for years since Amazon Alliance. Like that was a you know, bazillion years ago. Years ago. <laughs> yeah, so long ago. Amazon Trebo was for Hell the yeah. win. I have to send um, you a picture of one that we're getting in uh, next week. Uh, oh, they're you're, awesome. You're, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. It's good. You're gonna like it. Yeah. Damn. I may or have may not have initiated the recently? purchase of that animal for <laughs> you guys. <laughs> I might be better off not seeing <laughs> oh, That's um, funny. Cool, man. But, so thank you very much yeah. for coming on. We're going to have to yeah, have man. you on again sometime soon. Yeah, man. please. This was fun. Cool, man. Have a nice night. Yeah. Sweet. All right, guys. Take care. See ya.